My name is Susanna Cafaro. I am the organizer of this conference on supranational democracy, the supranational democracy dialogue. quindi sembra che faremo due giorni di evento per dare spazio a tutte le idee interessanti che sono arrivate. Ma tutti italiani? No! La cosa incredibile è che gli italiani ce ne sono pochissimi, sono quasi tutti stranieri e alcune delle voci più interessanti vengono da altri continenti. Sono molto emozionato di essere in questa conferenza sul supranational democracy dialogue che really questions this space that is above states um, and the question of politics. Can we have politics at that level? I'm very happy to be here in this supranational democracy dialogue which I wanted to take part to and say uh, what I believe that the new technologies have a global impact. On, uh, on our world, on our planet. As someone working in citizen engagement, governance innovation, the law, uh, when you hear of a conference called Supranational Democracy, you want to go. My contribution today is around rights of nature, the idea of being in the midst of an earth renaissance that we're all feeling as humans in our bodies, in our DNA. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity over the last two days and a really amazing time to bring together not only act academics but also activists, thinkers from a whole range of different subjects to look in the broadest possible way at what is supranational democracy and why do we need it. fare un intervento che serva a inquadrare l'argomento, a far sentire tutti parte dello stesso discorso, quindi a dare anche una cornice e allo stesso tempo che semplifichi, che semplifichi il tema e che quindi consenta anche al pubblico di entrare in argomento e di capire cosa intendiamo per supranational democracy. Supranational democracy is essential if we want to deal with a number of political and existential even issues of the world which the states cannot deal with on their own and if we want these solutions to have the legitimacy of citizens. The future of uh, uh, supranational democracy is one that um, is indicated already by the SDGs and I think that the Committee on World Food Security is an example uh, of already of uh, that dialogue aimed at addressing the root causes of food security. The question basically is how to get there. The need is obvious. Global problems need global solutions. How do we get rid of nuclear weapons? How do we deal with climate change, etc.? Uh, whoever is working on this, on this COP set should take into account this these technologies and how they will develop because they will have a huge impact on the world. So I was very happy to take part in this, in this dialogue and to see all different kind of uh, informations and speeches uh, because the supranational democracy is such a wide and deep argument and there is so much work to do. And that when we talk about supranational democracy that we need to think about ourselves as nature, as a part of the global body that is Earth. Perché questa parola sovranazionale che cosa di particolare? Perché c'è un motivo se abbiamo scelto sovranazionale non internazionale o globale. Okay. L'ho intitolato così: Supranational Politics: The Time Has Come. È arrivato il tempo della politica sovranazionale. Mi sono ispirata a una citazione che mi piace tanto di Victor Hugo che dice niente è più potente di un'idea di cui è venuto il tempo. Perché se ci pensate ci sono state delle idee che in passato sono state giudicate folli semplicemente perché non era ancora il tempo. We're going to start by talking about some problems most of which uh, won't be particularly news to us but as a means to frame the discussion 
and then we're going to talk about some innovations and prospective solutions to some of these challenges. I will give you an example uh, of the speech which I'm going to give tomorrow and which concerns refugees. And uh, I know that the issue of refugees in Italy is quite hot as it used to be in Greece. It is still in Greece. I'm trying to invent a solution that will no longer deal with the refugee issue as a national issue, but will transform it into a European political solution. The alienation of the populace, um, where uh, familiar with the unfulfilled promise of the Arab Spring, which itself was caused by uh, failure of the status model of development, and Malik and Awadal at Oxford did excellent work on this in showing that um, the state's attempt uh, within the Middle Eastern countries to uh, maintain extensive control over political and economic as well as financial decision making and reluctance to let the private sector or the social sector develop robustly uh, as well as the uh, demographic shifts amongst Arab youth contributed to um, the, uh, the revolutions um, and the fact that the institutions were weak to begin with created problems as well. So we see here again an instance of where an impulse towards uh, promoting rigidity creates to gr uh, leads to greater fragility. Um, disputed elections and the rise of extremist groups, we've discussed this as well. Uh, failed se secession movements, um, Catalonia, Iraq, uh, this has been mentioned this morning in the acute refugee crises. A possibility to perhaps turn the argument, the criticism of lack of uh, democracy in the international arena on its head and instead for a call for a re-nationalization of authority which is the main claim uh, that the nationalistic populists are putting forth that we could turn that argument on its head and explore whether it might be uh, more feasible and more to the empowerment of the ordinary people to instead uh, develop uh, avenues to democratize the international order. So bring a real democratic uh, development forth into the supranational uh, world as well. And I realized that the government that I was a part of wasn't particularly well equipped, uh, wasn't really agile enough to address those concerns and really wasn't particularly interested um, or was maybe too self-interested. Uh, and, you know, I don't think it's a, a radical thing to say in a room like this one that, you know, our current democracies are not always very responsive to emergent uh, concerns and, and, um, and new ideas from people. And so, uh, you know, I, I felt like it was a, a time to, to look for something different. So the interconnectivities of the goals makes the interconnectivity also of the actions in a way. And this is what we, we as UNHRD are, are doing. And the conflict have a, have a tremendous impact on the food insecurity. Uh, on the other hand, the food insecurity has a tremendous impact on the, on the, on the conflict. So we, we talk about a circle, and this creates also internal displacement. It creates migration. Uh, it's all interconnected. I see the path towards universal democracy as a long one, but one that can be accelerated through disciplined, bottom-up approaches that leverage the use of technology with the rights-based approaches of political philosophy and the multilateral institutions to create more inclusive uh, and more beneficial institutions and societies for all of humankind. E un modello che sia eh, non di cooperazione internazionale ma sovranazionale. Cosa vuol dire? Vuol dire la creazione di una dimensione politica non tra le nazioni internazionali ma sopra, sopra le nazioni, sopra gli stati cioè in grado di avere una legittimazione, una responsabilità, un'inclusività sua che viene dal basso, viene dai cittadini, non viene dagli stati. Quindi così come gli stati hanno una loro legittimazione, hanno una loro responsabilità, hanno una loro inclusività, gli stati, le regioni, le città, così anche il livello globale dovrebbe avere direttamente legittimazione dai cittadini.
the idea of supranational democracy is not only to have a, uh, a supranational level, but to have a multi-layer system of uh, collective choices. And the way that these digital systems ought to grow should be consistent with the international agreements which have established uh, norms regarding rights and goals uh, around which there was broad international agreement, not just from states, but from the global citizenry, and which were often created in a very participatory way, as we've heard earlier. And digital tools afford a new mechanism to track and drive progress towards those in such a way that uh, not just governments and multilaterals ought to be accountable for driving us towards them, but the global populace should be as well. And we've had this thing called Earth Day happening. It's a global phenomenon, but still, we're coming against the 50 year anniversary in 2020. And have we made progress in understanding what it means to be in relationship to the earth? That's the question. So let me share my frustration when I was 10 years old looking at the earth going, oh my ah. I was being fed stories through the newsreel, through the media, through television, and it was all about the men who landed on the moon but I wanted to see the Earth. So here goes the narrative. Man's great conquering, you know, this great victory. And it gets even more profane. Look at this ad where man is just propped up and he's got his Heineken or whatever it is. You know, forget the Earth, I'm, you know, here's what it's about. Well, in my view, I'll just land right into my thesis here is I do believe in that moment that an earth renaissance began. It wasn't one about books destroyed in the libraries of antiquity. No, it's something more intimate, more primal than that. It's that which we come from. Questo ci apre una serie di problemi. Abbiamo un mondo preparato alla dimensione globale non solo dal punto di vista del commercio, degli scambi, della comunicazione, ma anche del dialogo politico. Quindi le, le organizzazioni internazionali che esistono sono già attrezzate, possono essere attrezzate o vanno completamente reinventate. Really questions this space that is above states um, and the question of politics. Can we have politics at that level? And I think that today uh, we can easily see that countries are failing to handle so many of the problems that are harming us. And I think that um, some say, oh, democracy itself is problematic, but I think that trying to let local democracies, trying to handle global issues is just, just not working and we need to then extend democracy beyond the state level. So there's a way we all have to shift our identity quite fundamentally to believe that we're all in the same boat and identities are actually much more flexible that we, than we think. We can expand it and we can contract, we can regress. So, you know, we have to get this inner revolution going on at the same time as we're doing the outer revolution because if not, we are just, you know, we, we, we're acting in, 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 in reaction. It is very likely that for the time being it will be a complementary uh, legitimacy strain which accompanies democratic legitimacy through states and through the democratic uh, uh, governance on sub-state and regional or local level. But in the long run, uh, I think humanity needs to find uh, a way to build up global systems of governance which then need legitimacy not only through representation by states but also in some way or another by, a legit by a legitimacy through representatives of citizens, of people. And so the uh, question that is really uh, my main concern is how do we get citizens into this process in a binding way that drives politicians towards implementing and cooperating on real global solutions? Civil society and non-governmental organizations and, and 
you know, Mira, all about that, representing smallholder family farmers, fisher folks, herders, landless, urban poor, they've all come together to create a mechanism and a network that feeds into the work of CFS. That's kind of the, the idea, that's the, the same spirit that's behind the Shared Nation platform. Um, Shared Nation's vision is to build a perpetual engine for group co-investment in solutions to global commons problems involving all people. And let me parse that statement a little bit. Um, perpetual engine refers to the idea that what we get people to do in Shared Nation is to combine their money together every month. People pool what they have every month and then they make a decision about what to do with that. Co-investment refers to the idea that this isn't sort of a version 1.0 crowdfunding platform where people give their money to lots of diffuse projects and ideas and people can sort of give to anything that's listed. We force ourselves to make a decision every month. We can choose to foment this democracy, see it as a cultural uh, um, question that has to be fed through institutions and through people, but we really have to start by attending to individual wellness and social ecologies in community again. Shared Nation is an attempt to respond to that. It's, it's, it's a bit grandiose, it's a bit quixotic. I own all of those things for sure, but it's an attempt to say, yes, we're in uh, seriously difficult times. On the other hand, uh, we're more connected and have more technological infrastructure than we ever could have imagined 20 or 30 years ago. And we have an opportunity to combine now in ways that we never could have imagined combining before. And that's what's at the heart of this idea is combination, is coming together as we never have before with our resources and with our time to actually try to change things in the world around us. That's, that's at the heart of, of this idea. È venuto fuori il programma perché si va, si va dal generale, l'evoluzione della democrazia dalla dimensione locale a quella globale, fino alla all'Europa come laboratorio di soluzioni democratiche sovranazionali passando per una serie di, di global issues, di temi globali. Then we started discussing on the need of nutrition it's it's not only the food is not only the the, the thing that that makes you uh, survive in terms of al alimentation how do you say it i'm just inventing a word uh, but it's but it's also nutrition that it's relevant now to maintain the nutrition the nutrient inside of food which are which are key for pregnant mother for for little kids etc we need also to work on on keeping them well stored. So in the lab in Brindisi, in our small lab, we created this insulation that is now used everywhere to keep the temperature at the right level. And so we were fine, you know, we store it. And then we start thinking, okay, but from the, from the moment the suppliers send this nutritious food to the moment we get it, are we sure that, that, that that the temperature is correct. So what we are working now is this uh, silver thing that you see here. Transport the food, the temperature is kept to the right level for, to maintain the nutri nutritious. But when it arrives on the field, in order not to create garbage, if you open it, and this is the, the tea that you see there, each of the pieces can become a mattress or can be used to insulate a, a, a prefab so those who receive the food, not only receive the food, but also receive other items. So we are trying to reduce the waste. Th these are as example. So this can be transformed in a cradle. And because uh, a family can also have other children, we put a blackboard. So while the little one sleeps, the other can draw. And this we have done with UNICEF. So we, we are working with them. We developed a blockchain-based label and tag that they put in all the clothes designed by, by this designer, Martin Jargard from the Netherlands. And it's a pilot project. She is a very small designer, she has a small supply chain, but they managed to follow the product from the farm where the cashmere was, um, was developed until the, the very end of the production influencing the designer practices and choices. On the same line, we see that Avery Dennison, that is the m biggest labor producer in the world, 
using, in, using new technologies and engaging in creating immutable digital profiles on the blockchain and put them in, in labels. And finally, we have some initiatives from the industry, such as the HIG Index, that was developed by the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, and that gives measurable uh, criteria for um, addressing sustainability performance, assessment, reporting, and it's really widespread among the industry, and it seems that it's becoming slowly a generally adopted global standard. So, in my opinion, with the uh, uh, this fourth industrial revolution we started just a couple of years ago, there are at stake political and social issues and the effect will spread on all social dimensions and also on individual level. So this process all, of course involves different social, political, economical and cultural actors. Just because what I say, if technologies are developed by large corporations only, if there are no regulation, that can be a bad issue. But I believe it is possible to imagine and to design new policies and what better than some supranational uh, uh, democracy or supranational institution able to do that. So I believe the positive outcome will depend on how we will address on a political side these issues uh, on a planet scale. Emphasize the principle of democracy before universality. Um, and that avoids this problem of confronting a UN Charter. So it allows the European strategy, it allows you to start with a smaller group, the democracies, and then progress stage by stage um, to the final goal. And following the um, European example, uh, the first stage should probably be some community of democracies. Because if people see global agreements functioning and they can see the benefits of them, they're going to want to formalize it. And that's where the world federalism, I think, comes in. So what we need, apart from simultaneous implementation and other things I'll come to in a, in a moment, is a way that we can allow citizens to compel their national governments to cooperate. And one possibility is what I've been experimenting with, with for the last 18 years since that uh, Sunday lunch with my family um, called the Simultaneous Policy, or SIMPOL for short, Politica Simultanea, I think it would be in Italian. So how does it work? <clears throat> you could say that, what is it about? It's about using our votes in a new way to drive governments to cooperate to solve global problems how to make global agreements successful and how we can make it happen. Simpol has two sides. It's a policy or a, a range of policies to solve global problems, but it's also a process. First as a policy, so it's a range of global policies to be designed or strongly influenced by citizens. Okay, it's not going to be designed by corporations or politicians, it's going to be designed by us, by anyone who signs up to Simpol. And it will, can include only those policies that nations cannot implement alone. Okay, so it doesn't touch national policies like, uh, I don't know, housing or, or education or any of those things because those are things that are within the national purview. They are within the national sovereign domain. Things like climate change, corp, you know, re-regulating re financial markets, corporate taxation, getting rid of tax havens, all of these things actually that are really important are now in the simultaneous domain, we could say. The solution, as I see it, is to create some kind of federal world state that is an idea that is actually not very new at the end of the Second World War. There have been Einstein and Gandhi and there have been a huge movement that was demanding a world federation. We will ever get, uh, we, will, we will be able to pass some sort of global regulation on transnational corporations if we really democratize global decision making. Like, that's really the fundamental only way. And the only way to change that graph is to do that. For us, supranational democracy is a way to give the people the right to have a say 
on issues which cannot be dealt with by the states. It requires a change in mentality, a change of paradigm if we want. If we want. It requires to move from what one would consider to be national citizenship to what we could qualify global citizenship with global responsibilities, global solution and global accountability. And I think this will be the, the first, hopefully, of many conferences and dialogues in this way um, and it's really been an honour to be here.